Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story. New manager introduced Mexican cuisine to our restaurant, screwed up and got fired. The second story. New neighbor took part of our site and got revenge from us with the help of pigs. After he sold his land, we got good neighbors. Today's first story is I'll make the quesadillas exactly as ordered, but you pay the dry cleaners. Back in the beginning of the 21st century, I was working in a cafe slash sandwich shop. It was a 24-7 shop in a prime location, in an area with a lot of uni students and very active nightlife, and the road was a major artery for anyone traveling in or out of the city. When I started as a first year uni student trying to make some money, the shop was one of four of a small chain. Gary, the owner slash manager, has bought the rights from the original shop. Gary was also doing quality control for the shop because at that point every shop had separate vendors. Fast forward two years. The original owners decided to incorporate because they have a lot of offers for franchising and a couple of problems with quality control have appeared. So they bought back all the shops and instituted a more centralized approach to vendors. That was good for Gary because he was the owner of the building, so he basically became a salaried manager and got extra income from the rent. Initially nothing changed, we were still number two in sales, product was good. Then Dick entered the picture. Dick was the new regional manager. The small chain had become big enough to reach national level, and the person responsible for quality control. He was considered something of a golden boy, having a business degree and helping with the expansion. The problem came from his ego. You see, Dick had done a cooking workshop that provides a certificate but nothing more, and considered himself something of a chef. His first major change was installing a crepe station. Not restaurant quality crepes, but crepes on the go, folded like a triangle. That's important for later. While a B to learn at the beginning, it quickly became one of our best sellers. We usually went over 10L of crepe mixture on a slow day. Having success with his first change, Dick decided to apply his chef training and implement some new things. At that point in time, Mexican cuisine was becoming popular in my country, due mostly to cooking shows. Dick decides to ride the trend and starts putting Mexican options on the menu. In reality, that meant two more set sandwiches and crepes, the ones on the board, and a few more customization options for sandwiches and crepes. And here begins the problem. Dick knew Mexico from TV and did a pathetic kind of research. As I said, Mexican cuisine was quite the new thing. Our country's cuisine is way different than the Mexican, especially on the spice level. A lot of the produce used for Mexican food was either rare or non-existent, but Dick was adamant it was another win for him to find a vendor. And the quality started to fail. We started to receive buckets of pre-made chili and queso and jars of pickled jalapenos and pre-made guacamole and pico de gallo dips. Also, blocks of white cheese labeled queso blanco. The queso was an orange paste with some red bits in it. According to Hubby, under a bad light it could pass for bad queso. And the left a very plastic taste. It reminded us of clay. One taste of that kept me away from Mexican food for a while. The jalapenos weren't jalapenos. They were pickled Thai green chilies, labeled as jalapenos, meaning they were way hotter than expected. I've never tasted the rest, but some adventurous customers that tried them weren't impressed. The only new thing that kind of sold was a plate of nachos, basically because it was Doritos covered in queso. When it was heated, it became an orange liquid, a lot of bacon and a lot of sausage. We've complained about the quality to Gary, but he couldn't do anything anymore, and Dick doesn't back down. Dick is a bit upset from the low sales. He blames us, you're not pushing them enough, and the customers. Those barbarians couldn't recognize a filet mignon from a shank, but he sticks to his guns, and then brings corporate to the shop. Dick comes in with four people from HQ, two of them are the owners. They sit, and Dick comes and places an order of five quesadillas. It's a self-service shop. I ask how he wants them. Exactly as it says on the board, and prepared exactly as I told you, he replies. Okay, sir, I'll call you when they're ready. I replied, smiling. Now, Dick, in all his chefy wisdom, has given us very specific instructions for the quesadillas. First, to take out of the way, it wasn't a proper quesadilla, it was a crepe. The instructions were, reheat the chili, start the crepe, place one and a half ladles of reheated queso, Add one ladle of the chili, add a tablespoon of chopped jalapenos, one tablespoon of queso blanco, half a tablespoon of guacamole and fold. Doing that produced a liquid mess, which tried really hard to escape from a thin crepe. We usually reheated the queso only for nachos. Especially in a crepe, we put it cold and let it reheat with the plate's heat to avoid the aforementioned mess. Cue malicious compliance. We, me and the other girl working, made five quesadillas exactly as instructed. I took the order to the table. It was corporate after all, and waited for the results. Five people wearing white shirts and suits bite into the quesadillas. The quesadillas almost simultaneously explode, raining melted cheese and red chili on them. 
some of them a bit in a jalapeno and the heat is hitting them hard. A few choice words were heard. We brought them two bottles of water for the heat and two full packs of napkins to clean what they could. Let's say the new menu wasn't a blast with HQ. After they left, Dick came back. He was beyond angry. He approached the bench, bypassing the line. It was during one of our rush hours and made a scene. The following dialogue is a bit censored. You stupid bee, you made me look bad because you don't like Mexican food. You can't even follow basic instructions. The cleaning of your mess will be deducted from your pay. And some other more offensive stuff. I was standing there dumbfounded, along with the line of customers hearing his outburst. And then Gary intervened. Shut the F up. What the F did you say, Dick replied? I said shut the F up. The girls followed your instructions to the letter. Don't try to blame them for your mistake, or make them pay for your dry cleaning. Dick, I can do what the F I want, and when I'm finished with them, maybe I'll find another manager for this shop. Gary, I would love to see you try. Dick, oh, I will, I will, and he stormed out. Fallout. Immediately, Gary called HQ and notified them about what happened. He also gave an ultimatum. If something happened to his staff, the company would need to find a new location. Three days later, we were notified that Dick was fired. While his outburst was the main reason, one of the owners having a really bad reaction to the jalapenos. A week later, the Mexican menu was removed. During that part, they found out that Dick had used the cheapest vendor for the new menu. The vendor had a reputation for shady practices, which partly explained the weird products. I stayed there until I finished uni and got a job in my field. The Mexican menu made a huge comeback two years before I left. This time, HQ had hired a proper chef to consult and find vendors. Now the ingredients are as authentic as possible, and pico and guac are made daily in-house. They also have good queso now, although it took me a long time to try it. And no pre-packaged pre-made chili. I now know the different cuisines of Mexico. Jesus and his wife Sophia are the ones I thank most for that, and Tex-Mex. Back then we had a lot of imported cooking shows on TV, and chili especially was promoted as the ultimate Mexican food. In fact, no chili at all. My repulsion to Mexican food ended when my husband took me to a proper Mexican restaurant and finally tested a proper Mexican meal. The place my husband took me is run by Mexican immigrants. They keep their recipes as authentic as possible, family recipes, and had made slight adjustments for the things they can't produce. The next story is, never mess with a rancher and a neighbor. My father had the ultimate revenge when I was a kid. I grew up on a horse ranch in Colorado. We had a long piece of property, about 80 acres, and we raised Missouri fox trotters. We had lived there for almost 20 years, when some folks bought a strip of property way at the back of our land. It was a strange plot of land, as it was very narrow, and was sandwiched between our back fence and a busy country road. We were surprised anyone would buy it, actually, as it forced the house to be pretty close to said road. Well, we never meet these new neighbors until once day, my dad gets a notice from a lawyer telling us that after having surveyed the property lines, our back fence encroaches on their property between three and six inches, depending on the spot along the fence line. These folks had never met us, never introduced themselves. Our first introduction was this legal demand. My father was a salt of the earth kind of man, very kind, but also very strong willed. He called these folks, arranged to meet up and tried to talk some sense into them. First, did three to six inches really matter that much? And why had they not come to us to talk it through? He even offered a number of different compromises. These folks were hostile from the get-go. They demanded he move the fence immediately, or they would sue. Apparently, the law stated they had to put their house so far away from our fence line, and they wanted to push it as far back from the road as they could when they built it. So they wanted that six inches very badly. I still remember when my dad got home from the meeting. He hung his hat up and shook his head when he told my mom in his slow way, Well, looks like we got the kind of folks for neighbors you don't ever want to have for neighbors. This is what my dad proposed to the neighbor, after getting the letter to move the fence, but before we ended up in court. He really did want to try to cultivate a good relationship with a new neighbor, even though they started out on such a lousy foot. He offered to sell them five acres of land at the back of the property at a super affordable price so they could have a better plot and get well back from the road. Our back fence line was almost five acres long, so it would have shaved an acre long line off is all, and that was wooded land that was not good pasture land anyway. They were not interested. They had plenty of funds too, by the way, as they were sitting on a million dollar payout from selling their home in California which we knew as they brought it up multiple times in the discussion. Statements that they had all the money they needed to take us to court if we didn't comply immediately. My dad asked if he could move the fence over time then, rather than being hit for the cost all at once. Ranchers are not made of money. We could move the section right behind the proposed building site immediately to help with the planning, etc. first. They were not willing to do that. It all had to be moved immediately. Lastly, my dad was friends with the two guys that did the inspections for the county for this kind of stuff. We had built many additions and changed on the ranch over time as well. They were all the volunteer fire department together as well. He offered to get all them together and see what options they had for dealing with the offset issue. 
The neighbor refused, again demanding the fence be moved immediately. They sued and won, and we were forced to move the fence in two weeks. I say we because I was the free slave labor, as all farm kids are in this kind of thing. All that fencing material and the time were a big cost for my family, but we got the work done in early spring. Here's where the fun comes in. So the new neighbors broke ground and built all through the end of winter and into spring. The very next weekend after they had moved into their house, Dad roused me out of bed and we took the big truck into town to the lumber yard. I was extremely puzzled, as we loaded up a bunch of fencing material and building supplies. We didn't have any big projects going on that I knew about, and I kept asking him what it was for, but he just told me to wait and see with a devilish smile on his face. We built a pen in a small enclosure very near our back property line, directly behind the neighbor's new shiny house. The next day, one of our farm friends delivered a half dozen pigs to their new home. Dan insisted on feeding those hogs table scraps and all the things that would go into the composter, as well as some good balanced hog feed to keep them healthy. Now, you may not know this, but the smell of pig excrement is directly related to what they eat and their pen. Table scraps make them smell bad. I mean bad. I had to drive the four-wheeler back there every day to take care of them, and within a month halfway there and my eyes would start watering it smelled so bad. When we mucked out the pen with the bobcat, we also made the pile right next to the pen. I can't even imagine how bad the smell was living in that house. The neighbors, of course, freaked out, and again without ever even trying to talk to us, went the legal route. They lost, the area was zoned agricultural, and my dad had done his homework to make sure he was breaking no laws or regulations. The pigs were far enough from us and our other neighbors that it didn't bother anyone, but the people he wanted it to bother. Come fall when winter moved in, we sold the pigs to slaughter, and dad stacked up a bunch of building supplies next to the pen, and let the neighbors know we would be expanding the profitable operation in the spring, when they came out to scream at him. He smiled the whole time, speaking in his slow, steady way. The new neighbors sold their new house in January when the ground was frozen, and the new owners would not smell the pen. Though as soon as the old neighbors were gone, we tore down the enclosure, spread the nasty stuff on the hayfield, and the new neighbors never had any bad smell come spring. They were also great neighbors, and are still lifelong friends. Never mess with a rancher. There's no pleasing some people, so my dad let him take us to court. I later found out that dad was using the time to save up some money, since he figured he would have to move the fence, and that was expensive, and he hoped maybe the neighbor would not push it that far, and come to work with him rather than go to all that cost. I know my dad reached out a couple more times to the neighbor before things went to court too. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.